Have you ever wondered how you're going to put it all together? Maybe it was a project at work or some home renovation. Could have been a puzzle. Often the best way to start is to take it one piece at a time. Our sermon series, Putting It All Together, is focusing on how to put our faith into practice. If we are the living sacrifices Paul encourages us to be, then all of our life can be used in some way to God's glory. How hands-on can you be if your faith never affects your handiwork? How is our mind renewed and transformed by the gospel? Where should a Christian walk or look? Join us and let the Holy Spirit help put it all together, one piece at a time. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, putting it together maybe is slightly more complicated than putting together Mrs. Potato Head, but thank you to Clara for letting me use that. Uh, um, but we will be puzzling together over the next several weeks about how do we put our faith into action. There's uh, something very satisfying about putting the last piece of the puzzle together, whether it's a 12-piece puzzle or a thousand piece puzzle when you put work into something it's it's great to see all your hard work pay off one of the most uh, of course most people don't do a uh, most people don't do a puzzle uh, that they can complete in just a minute or two it usually takes some time and, and concentration and perhaps a lot of squinting as you look closely and try to get those pieces put together well, over the next six weeks, we might do a little bit of squinting as we puzzle out how to put our faith into practice. And the way we're focusing on that is, is focusing on the specific things that different parts of our bodies can do and how we might have a Christian head, if that makes sense, or Christian hands, um, a different way of breaking it down. How does our faith change how we think or, or, or feel, for instance? Or how does our faith ha navigate from our head and our heart to our hands and, and eyes and feet? How does faith change how we see and interact this world in which we live in? Before we get down to the nitty gritty though, we're gonna start with uh, an overview. Like all parts of our faith, sanctification, which is a fancy term for holy living or, or living out the Christian life, starts with Jesus. That's why Paul waits until the second half, the back half of Romans, before he jumps into a bunch of application and practical advice that we see a little bit of in our reading for today. Before we, before we, uh, before we get down to the nitty-gritty, we are starting with an overview. Like all part, oh, yeah. Before we think about what we should do, though, we have to realize, first of all, first things first, what God has done for us. What did Jesus do? Well, pretty simply, he did it all. Jesus didn't just give us a, a gentle nudge in the right direction with the cross. It's sanctification, or I mean, saved by grace is more than a coupon for 50% off of, of God's goodness or, or eternal life. Early in Romans, Paul puts it this way, Now apart from the righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Uh, there are, for all who believe, there is no difference for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now this is a pretty fundamental Lutheran teaching, but it's, it's easy for us to lose sight of, and that's this, right? We're saved by grace. We don't earn God's grace. Instead, out of thankfulness for all that God has done for us, we live out lives of gratitude. No one has to force us to do this. Rather, the Holy Spirit and the example of Christ motivate us so that we want to live our lives for others. Now, to be clear, again, as we're, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about how we should act, what we should do as Christians, let's make it 100% clear. God doesn't change how much he loves you if you say more prayers or do more nice things. He loves and redeemed you 100% already. We just want to show love to others. 
Uh, because Not because we have to earn holy points, but simply because we've experienced what a wonderful gift the grace of God is, and we want to share that experience with others. And God has done so much for us that we want to do just a little for others. I say all that because there's some things where the order matters, right? Well, a lot of things, really. But, for instance, the Reds, I think they, well, I think it was last night they won, right? Did the Reds win last night? Anybody confirm? Oh, okay. Maybe. Yes, okay, good. We got some Reds fans here. Yeah, Reds won. And in baseball, some things have to, first things first. And you can't ever get to second base if you're a runner, if you never get to first base, right? You you can't run straight to second base. That's the error that kids first learning the game make. Um, saved by grace is first base for us. We've got to get to first base, accepting and giving thanks for God and for grace before we can get to second base, sanctification. But we'll probably review it, but I'll take it for granted, I guess, that, that most of us kind of get that. We've experienced God's grace. We don't earn God's favor by doing good. But nonetheless, God calls us to do good things. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, Paul encourages us to worship God. But he doesn't just say, come to church and sing songs. What does he say? He says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. For this is your spiritual act of worship. You see, God is not primarily interested in our money or our accomplishments. God is interested in you, in your soul, in your being. He values you. Therefore, he, the way that we glorify him is not by paying him off like he's a tax man or something, but rather by living lives of sacrifice. God, and why does God want us to do this? Well, God wants us to live good lives because he wants a good world. And so he tells us the way to worship him is not by putting yourself first, but rather by living for a purpose, for God's purpose. Which again, he's shown us it's not that God's trying to take advantage of us, it's not that he wants us to spend all our time or money on him, but rather to steal words from the book of Micah. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God wants us to live lives of sacrifices, not simply to make him happy, but because he wants the world that we live in and others live in to be a better place. And when we put him first and think of others, it becomes a better place than it would if we put only ourselves first. So, uh, down to the living sacrifice. What is a living sacrifice? We use the word sacrifice today primarily as a, a metaphor. However, in the ancient world, sacrifice was an everyday reality. A sacrifice was an uh, offering, something, wine, grain, sometimes animals, an offering given to someone else. Typically, when we think of sacrifice, we're thinking of it being given to a god or to the Lord, Yahweh. Now, Animal sacrifices may seem a bit barbaric, but, I mean, let's just be real. We make animal sacrifices still today all the time. We just don't sacrifice to God. We sacrifice to ourselves, if you want to put it that way. Or we sacrifice them in the name of profit and money. We overproduce food because, frankly, we're willing to waste a bunch as long as it means we have our favorite food whenever we want it. Simply eating beef or chicken is, is technically, you know, a, a sacrifice, an animal's life offered to sustain mine. I, at least when I think about that, it makes it seem not so distant, um, but okay, it's just reality. And, and we do the same sort of thing, we just maybe don't want to think about it. Uh, in ancient Israel, also, there wasn't as much coinage and money to go around. They didn't have, they weren't printing paper money. So, in order to put your offering in the offering plate, you didn't write out a check and send it in an envelope. Instead, you bought a sacrifice. Grain, or wine, or an animal, or something else, maybe. Likewise, if you wanted to buy something, you'd be as likely to offer a chicken for it as you would a $5 bill or some gold. Um, or maybe you'd give some produce. You, you did more bartering. 
Some of Israel's sacrifices, in fact, for that matter, were, they weren't, uh, many of them were eaten by people. You people, they would be sacrificed, but the Levites or the priests would eat them. Others were simply burned as an offering to the Lord. The point being is sacrifices typically were no longer alive. <laughs> uh, that's kind of was included in, in the term sacrifice. But Paul, in the light of Christ, death and resurrections tells Christians that we ought to live out the reality of Christ's resurrection in our own lives because we've been crucified with Christ and yet we live. But how should we live? Well, we've, we've been redeemed. We've been rescued from sin and death. So it would be like a, a dog returning to its vomit if we were to return to our folly, to going back to the the tired and broken and, and uh, empty ways of living that sin once trapped us in. Instead, God calls us to live out lives of purpose. And have you ever met somebody who's had a uh, near-death experience? Uh, or maybe you read a story about them. Or maybe, they survived, uh, or maybe they survived a serious illness. I think some people who I've talked with who've, who've had COVID recently have kind of Grown, their appreciation for life has grown uh, because there was some real trepidation for a while. Often after surviving something like that, that's what happens. Well, Christians, we realize if we look at the scriptures that we've all had a near-death experience because we deserve death. We should have suffered eternal death for all our sins a thousand times over, and yet God keeps forgiving us. You've sinned this week, I'm pretty sure. You said something terrible or you did something devious, and yet your Lord still loves you. And you don't have to worry about that sin anymore because you confessed it and God forgave it. You and I, we deserve to be punished. We deserve death. If we were just left to our own, even apart from sin, we would be headed for the grave at some point, and yet... God has bought us back from the grave. And so we've had that near-death experience, and so also, too, Christians, when we realize that, it gives us a greater appreciation for the life that God has given us in Christ. That's part of what it means to be a living sacrifice. Also, it's important to remember that Jesus, of course, was the very first living sacrifice. Um, he was sacrificed and slaughtered is hardly a strong enough word to describe what happened to him. Jesus was killed and sacrificed as the high priest said, it's better that one man die for the people. Of course, the Sanhedrin, right, they would certainly have much rather Jesus died than their position be threatened. But unbeknownst to them, Jesus wished for the exact same thing. He would rather die to keep us alive. God isn't asking us to do anything that he hasn't already done for us. God did sacrifice his only begotten son. This was the only way that he could cut through the sin and hardness of the human heart and wake us up while simultaneously defeating death. And Jesus was not forced to do this, right? He was, that's important as we talk about these sacrifices also, that it's a willing sacrifice, starting with Jesus. He was a willing sacrifice because, make no mistake, Jesus certainly faced great distress and, and loneliness and despair and, of course, most obviously physical torment, but he went to the cross of his own volition. He had multiple opportunities to turn around, but he kept saying, this is the Father's will, this is the plan of salvation, I'm going to do it, because he was willing to give up his life for the good of another, for your and my lives specifically. He who was God, perfect, righteous, and, and by any sort of measurement we use, far more valuable and central to life and to the universe than you or I, yet he decided to sacrifice himself for our salvation. And that too gives us a wonderful and great appreciation for life that we did not earn, and yet you have it right now. 
So we too, having experienced the benefits of forgiveness, life, and salvation that Jesus won for us, we too learn to be willing sacrifices. God doesn't force us, nor does he want to force us to live for him. But as we experience God's grace, we decide, we, we don't even decide, we we start to want to do what God calls us to do. We want to. We see how love is a better way, how the way that God offers is better, and so we want to make a, a positive difference. So, taking that for granted, I guess next week we'll start talking about what that means with the renewing of our mind Paul talked about. So, get your head straight, or if you don't get it straight, we'll get it straight next week. But until then, go in the grace of God. In Jesus' name. Amen.